Greetings and welcome to the latest event in the Geese College of Business Global Challenges and Business Webinar Series. I'm Amanda Brantner, Senior Associate Director of Learner Relations with Geese College of Business at the University of Illinois, and I look forward to spending the next hour with you. Our faculty experts at Geese have developed this series of webinars to address the business implications of coronavirus and enable you to be better prepared for all the challenges it presents. We hope that today you'll gain some knowledge and strategies to not only weather this storm, but succeed through it. Before we get started with liquidity management in the great lockdown, will there be a financial crisis on Main Street? With Professor Haytor Almeida, I want to cover a few housekeeping items related to the Q&A portion of today's session. Please submit all of your questions via the Zoom Q&A feature. Your questions will be submitted publicly for everyone in the audience to see. In order to develop consensus around questions, please use upvoting. The upvote thumb is located next to the question in the Q&A window. You can only upvote a question once, but you can reverse your vote. We will bring the top questions to Professor Almeida following the presentation. Any general housekeeping questions will be answered in text by the GEESE team working in the background. Questions submitted via chat will not be taken. It's now my privilege to introduce today's presenter, Haytor Almeida. Haytor joined the University of Illinois in 2007, and he has risen to a number of leadership roles during his time here. He has served as the director of the Finance PhD program, and he is currently academic director of our online MBA, or as we call it, the IMBA. Professor Almeida is a recognized expert in liquidity management, financial distress, and corporate governance. He currently teaches courses in mergers and acquisitions, financial management, corporate finance, and more. Please join me in welcoming Professor Haytor Almeida. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to, you know, to give this talk and uh, share some ideas with you. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. All right, um, so the uh, topic today is going to be liquidity management uh, in the great lockdown or, you know, which was caused by the COVID-19 crisis. And in particular, uh, besides talking about what happened and how companies and the government responded to the crisis, I want to also consider, you know, what's going to happen in the near future, right? You know, it's always difficult to make predictions, but uh, we're going to talk about it and let's see how, how far we can go. Um, so um, this is a different type of crisis uh, that uh, especially when you compare it to the uh, most recent crisis we went through, the 2007-2009 financial crisis, uh, which hit mostly households and banks, right? And perhaps indirectly the, the uh, corporate sector, but COVID-19 for sure is a direct hit to non-financial corporate cash flow. So that's why we are thinking of this as a Main Street crisis. That's why, you know, from, from Wall Street to Main Street, because this really is a Main Street crisis. Uh, and uh, because the crisis is different, we had different responses as well, both from firms and from, from the government, which is partly what we're going to talk about today. How did companies and the government responded to it? So let me just give you a summary of the ideas we're going to discuss in the beginning, and uh, I, and we, you know, I, I think we're going to be able to have time. You know, I practice, right? Which is what you should do well, when you give this talk. Uh, but so I'm going to start by characterizing the liquidity crisis, uh, and 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 then talk about uh, how companies and the government responded. The the way that companies responded is what we call dash for 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 cash and. The, the government uh, uh, response was basically to provide liquidity to the corporate sector. And one important consequence of how companies responded to the crisis is that there was a significant increase in corporate debt, okay? Um, and uh, which leads us to our next topic, right? Uh, what's going to happen in the near future, right? Are we going to have a financial crisis in Main Street? And what can we do about it? Right? So what can the government, you know, we're not the government, right? But 
what can the government do about it? So let me say up front, I saw in the beginning, you know, there, I know there are people from all over the world, right, uh, attending this. The focus today is going to be mostly in the US, uh, which is where I have data from and uh, you know, most of the academic analysis has been using the US, but some of the insights I hope are going to be useful for other countries as well. Um, and um, you know, so, so let, let's see, and if you have any specific questions about how this relates to emerging markets, let me know. But let me start just by showing you the magnitude of the shock. Uh, this, this, this picture shows uh, profit forecasts for the S&P 500. These are earnings per share for the S&P 500 companies. So these are large U.S. firms. And uh, these are for, uh, forecasts taken in different time periods. Uh, so it's sort of a rolling forecast. Uh, just focus on the green line here at the end and the, uh, and the uh, red line. So I just put an arrow here for you to, to see. So the, this, this green line is the for profit forecast as of February 2020. So everybody expected profits to increase, right? And uh, so, and the red line are forecasts as of May. And what you can see is clearly that uh, profits have tanked. Right, so for for 2020, uh, um, uh, basically uh, U.S. companies are, are going to suffer a very negative cash flow or earnings shock. Right. The other thing to 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 notice here is that as of today, uh, analysts are expecting a very robust recovery in profits. Right. So you can see that this red line it goes down, right, but then it's going back up. Okay. So, uh, you know, the analysts basically expect profits to, to, to go back up, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, something we're going to talk about later, right? I mean, is this really going to happen? Um, and uh, so the, the question is, right, we have this shock to short-term profits, right? What should companies do in this scenario, right? Where you have this negative uh, shock to, to cash flows. And what I'm going to do before I show you the, the data, is uh, what I like to do is just to show you a, the, an, an example of a company first. Uh, it's going to be the same example I used in my IMBA course this year. We actually discussed many of these issues and I saw some of my students who took the class this year already. So, uh, you know, you're going to be familiar with the example. Uh, but then we're going to, to, I'm going to give you some more general data as well. The example that I used is Roofs uh, Hospitality Group. Uh, Roofs is the owner of... Uh, of a steakhouse, right? The Roof Street Steakhouse. And uh, so it's a company that of course got affected very heavily by the COVID-19 crisis because it, it mostly operates indoor restaurants, right? The high, high end. And you can see, uh, you can look at these yourselves. I mean, for example, 2019, uh, Roofs produced EBITDA or uh, profits, you know, sales minus cost, basically $74.4 million. And the expectation is that for 2020, Roofs is not going to produce any profit, right? So it's basically zero. Uh, after that, as I said before, you know, the expectation of, the, of analysts is that profits are going to recover. So 2021 and 2022 are going to be profitable, profitable years again, right? So you have this negative cash flow, right? What's the problem? Uh, the problem that companies face, of course, is that companies have bills to pay, right? They have to make, uh, they have liabilities that are due. And uh, in, in fact, we can get data for, for Roof for 2020, they had about $60 million in uh, short-term liabilities, right? That they had to pay during 2020. They only had $5 million in cash at the beginning of 2020. So obviously what they need to do is they need to raise cash. Right, so they need to, to, to find a way to get cash somewhere. And uh, one, uh, point, one important point to note is that short term financing does not help. Right, so think about you know, you, you could raise a two month loan, for example, right, from a bank, but then you have to repay it back in two months. And the, the crisis is expected to last, you know, I mean, at least for 2020. So what companies had to do is to uh, go for long-term finance, right? So you need to issue, yeah, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you need to raise cash 
using some financial instrument that is that you don't have to repay you know in 2020 basically right so there are two options you could have used that companies could have uh, issued debt or issued equity right but what we know from a research in corporate finance is that at least in the us companies do not like issuing equity issuing new new equity is costly even when markets are up because uh, it's taken as a negative signal about the, the, the company. And especially the case when stock prices are depressed. So when markets are down, then companies are really avoid issuing equity. So basically what US companies did is they went for long-term debt. That was the source of funding that US companies tried to use in the middle of COVID-19. And it's pretty clear in the data, for example, in the case of Root, you can see that uh, in March, right at the beginning of the lockdown, what Root did is it issued new long-term debt. And you can see here the data, long-term debt went from $64 million to $145 million from you know, the end of December to the, to the end of the first quarter. And, uh, and then the other point to note is that uh, if you look at the cash balances of the company, right, what Roof did is it used some of these uh, debt to make payments, but it also held a large amount as cash balances. So you can see that uh, Roof increased its cash balances from $5 million to $71 million. Okay, so uh, this is... This is an example of what I like to call precautionary borrowing. I mean, if you took my IMBA class, you've seen this concept already. The idea is that increasing both long-term debt and cash together increases the company's financial flexibility, right? Because uh, you, you, you now have higher liquidity and your debt is only coming due in the future. At some point, you have to repay the long-term debt, but the expectation is by then, you know, when the long-term comes, COVID-19 will be over, right? I mean, hopefully. Uh, so, you know, you can think of it uh, using this, uh, this chart here that just kind of summarizes what companies did. So today in 2020, you have a low cash, you have a cash flow shock, right? You don't have profits. What you do is you borrow long-term, you issue long-term debt, hold the proceeds as cash, right? So in the meantime, what Roof can do is it can use this cash to pay bills, and then when tomorrow comes, you know, we're going to talk about tomorrow in the end of the presentation. When tomorrow comes, uh, cash flows will be back up and then Roof can easily repay this, this debt, right? So that is the liquidity management response that Roof uh, employed. And, uh, and it, it's, uh, it's, it, it turns out, as we're going to say, we'll see in a second, that this is, co this is consistent with all, what other companies did too. So... Uh, one problem, though, that roof, uh, that companies faced in the U.S. is that debt markets were not working well in the beginning of March, right? That's right about when the lockdown started here in the U.S. And, uh, uh, you know, debt markets reacted very negatively, right? So everybody wanted cash, including banks and uh, investors. So, you know, uh, uh, you, we can get several pieces of data to, to illustrate this. So what uh, this chart shows you is the price of highly leveraged loans. So this is the price of bank loans uh, in the US. And what happened in the beginning of March is there was a, a very significant drop in the price of loans. Basically, as this chart saying, it, uh, uh, reflecting the tightening of credit conditions in the primary loan market. So basically, it was very difficult for companies to borrow in the beginning of March. So, how did, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, how was Ruth able to issue debt? Uh, one of the answers has to do with credit lines, which is something I want to, to focus on today. So uh, what U.S. companies did is they, they relied on existing bank credit lines. So, and that was a very important source of long-term financing for U.S. companies. Uh, the, the advantage of a, of a credit line over a, a new loan or over issuing a bond is that credit lines have predetermined long terms, in, including interest rates and the, and the maximum amount that a company can borrow. So essentially, you have already contracted 
for this loan before March 2020. And when we look at the case of Ruth, this is exactly what Ruth did. Okay, so uh, they, they drew down on, 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 on the company's credit line. Here is a sent it's a, uh, um, an excerpt from a seekingalpha.com where I got this data from. Uh, in order to improve upon its liquidity, the company drew down from its credit revolver, which is the same thing as a credit line. On March 16th, right, right at the beginning of the crisis, they, uh, they, 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 they drew down $51.2 million and then they drew down another $5 million. Okay? And pay attention to the interest rate. Right? So this is March 2020. Interest rates on bonds for risky companies like Roof were almost 20% at that point. Where I mean, I'm going to show you the data in a second. Roof was able to borrow at less than 3%. Okay? And the only reason why this, this was the case is because they were able to use their credit line. Okay? So credit line is liquidity insurance. This is something we, we, we knew in corporate finance. And uh, every time there is a crisis, it's an opportunity to see credit lines working as, as insurance. You know, that's exactly their, their role for corporate finance. Right, and uh, uh, it's important to point out as well that access to credit lines is not free for all. Right, you know the, the bank is not going to give you insurance for 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 free. So what companies do is they have to pay what's called a commitment fee on the total drawdown limit. So for example, if a roof has a hundred million dollar credit line with uh, with a bank, then you have to pay uh, a fee that can be almost close to one percent a year on that amount irrespective of whether you draw on the credit line or not. So this is, you can think of a credit line as a corporate credit card. And uh, basically what we know from the, from the research, as I said, is that in times of crisis, credit lines are very important sources of funding for companies. Uh, and uh, this is more general data for the US economy as a whole. Uh, uh, what we see in the data is that there is a significant in, increase in uh, drawdowns. You know, in the month of March, really, it's a, it's a clear effect of, corona, of the coronavirus crisis. Between March and April, U.S. companies drew 300 billion, you know, 320 billion dollars from their bank credit lines in order to boost their liquidity. Okay, so that was one source of financing that is pretty clear. This is also a nice picture from the Financial Times. Uh, that shows the names of some of these companies that drew down on uh, credit lines. And uh, if you look at, if you go over these companies, you'll see that there are many uh, firms that were affected heavily by the crisis. For example, hotels are here, airlines, uh, uh, GM and Ford, uh, you, know, uh, you know, like uh, cruise companies, Nor Norwegian cruise lines, you know, Carnival. So these were firms that were, that uh, suffered a very negative cash flow shock what they did is they turned around and drew on their, on their credit line, okay? So that's something that we know that this, had, this clearly happened, but you know, not all companies have credit lines, right? So some companies actually had to borrow in markets because they did not have access to a credit line or maybe they didn't have a sufficient credit line. And as I discussed already, markets for long-term debt like bonds were virtually shut down in the beginning of March. So companies weren't really able to, to borrow. And this is what explains the government policy. So as we know, the Federal Reserve and the US Treasury have uh, created several different policies with the goal of providing liquidity to that market. So, uh, the uh, government, right, uh, you know, and it's not only uh, in, in, uh, um, true for the US, all over the, the, the world, uh, governments have tried to provide liquidity to, to the corporate sector because of the COVID-19 crisis. The government is a lender of last resort, right? So uh, I'm not gonna have time to go over the details of uh, all the, the different policies that the government, that the US government has uh, implemented, but I want to give you a, you know, a, a kind of a roundup and an introduction. So first of all, there is the CCF or the Corporate Credit Facility. And uh, uh, 
what I wanted to take away from the CCF is that the, the, the CCF targets mostly larger and safer firms. So, uh, uh, for, for example, a very important part of the CCF is the program that allows US, the U.S. government to buy investment-grade bonds in the market. So the, uh, the, the Fed can, can uh, take dollars and go to the bond market to buy bonds as an effort to boost the bond market and facilitate financing for, for, for companies. And in order to qualify for the CCF, a company has to have an investment grade rating. So that's what I mean. So these have to be, a, these have to be safer firms. And this is something we're gonna go back later when we talk about future policy. And then we have Main Street, uh, the Main Street Lending Facility, which is uh, 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 targeting different types of firms because these are, uh, these are firms that typically do not borrow in the bond market. These are firms that borrow from banks, right? Because they are smaller. Uh, the uh, Main Street is targeting companies with fewer than 15,000 employees or less than $5 billion in revenue. So these are basically mid cap. You can think of this as the mid cap US firms. Uh, and uh, the way that the program is structured is the loans are uh, originated by lenders. And you know, so banks are making these loans, but the government is uh, uh, providing the liquidity for the banks uh, you know, to allow them to, uh, to, to, to provide these loans. Okay, the important thing that I want you to remember from, the, from, from Main Street is that there are maximum leverage restrictions. And this is something we're gonna go back to at the end when we talk about future policies. To qualify for, for Main Street, a company has to have leverage lower than a certain amount. So companies that have too high leverage do not qualify, okay? And then finally, sorry, I skipped the slides. Finally, we have the PPP, right? The, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is basically forgivable loans. In fact, now there is a discussion. Uh, I just saw uh, an, an interview by uh, Steve Mnuchin talking about the fact that they, they, they might make these grants instead of loans. So it's a little bit different because these are basically uh, uh, forgivable, okay? So uh, the... The, the reason why the government is, use, is using banks, especially for, the, for Main Street, is uh, because clearly the US government is trying to focus on making good loans. Okay, so the idea, the, you know, the, the, the clear idea of these programs is that the government wants to provide liquidity, but at the same time, the government wants to make good loans that are likely to be repaid. Okay, so that's why, you know, the corporate credit facility focuses on large and safe firms, right? And then the bank is, uh, the, uh, the government is using banks to screen and monitor loans that are made to small and medium firms in order to, you know, make it more likely that these loans are going to be repaid. Okay, so that's an important consideration as well that we're going to go back later. So the, the U.S. government is providing liquidity, but is focusing on good loans. So... Did these programs work? You know, we have the answer already. The answer is yes. Okay, it's very clear in the data. Uh, for example, you can look at bond issuance uh, in 2020, right? So bonds are a very important source of long-term of long debt. Uh, and you can focus here at the end. This is the beginning of 2020. You can see that uh, U.S. companies were able to issue bonds, right? Uh, uh, you know, at a very successful rate. So you can see you know, several hundred billion dollars of bond issues happening in the US. And remember, you know, this is a liquidity management strategy. So uh, what, what companies did with this additional long-term debt is to increase cash holdings. So again, uh, we can look at data already for the beginning of 2020, and it's pretty clear across the board, irrespective of a credit rating, US companies were trying to increase their cash holdings as a way of boosting liquidity. Okay, and then we can also look at prices. Uh, you, we can look at bond spreads, which I promised I was going to do, right? Uh, so these are spreads uh, uh, at, uh, you know, bond spreads relative to U.S. Treasury. So that's the additional interest rate that companies pay to borrow in the bond market. And you can see that in the beginning of March, right? That's the, this is the period when bond markets shut down. There was a huge spike in, the, in bond spreads. But then right after the, the, the government intervened, 
bond spreads have come back down. This graph has two lines. Uh, the uh, yellow line in the bottom is for investment grade companies that are safer. The, the blue line is for a junk rated firm. Okay, so uh, you can see that the, the government was successful in uh, uh, reducing interest rates. And it's, it's even perhaps even more clear in this picture that focuses on leverage loans. So it's the same data I, sh I showed you before. Right at the beginning of the crisis, there was a huge drop in the price of highly leveraged loans. But uh, at this uh, vertical line here actually indicates the exact date in which the Fed announced the corporate bond buying program. And you can see that right at that date, the prices of highly leveraged loans started to recover. Okay, so the US government was basically successful in restoring liquidity to the, to the long term debt. So uh, to summarize what we learned so far, and uh, really this is what US academics learned by looking at the, uh, the you know, 2020 data, is a very clear picture, which showing that with the help of the US government and committed credit lines. So remember, you know, if you had a commitment, a committed credit line, then it was easier to, to borrow, right? The uh, US corporate sector, responded to COVID-19 by issuing long-term debt to increase cash hold. So that's basically what happened, right? Uh, you, uh, uh, the firms used uh, the uh, uh, long-term debt in order to increase liquidity and protect themselves against the negative cash flow. Yeah? So the question is, where does this leave us, right? You know what's going to happen? Is this enough or not? And where where are we going from here? That's you know it's it's very important to under, to understand what happened, right? But we also need to think about the future, and it's of course more even more important, right? The first point that I want to make is that liquidity is not enough, right? You know, this is just liquidity management is a short term strategy, right? So uh, as I think was pretty clear when I showed you this picture before. Right. Uh, uh, what what you uh, you know the this this uh, strategy that uh, companies use to increase liquidity it works, provided that cash flows go back up. Right. Uh, so you're borrowing, you're increasing long-term debt in the expectation that COVID-19 will be over and then your profits will be back up. But what if the high cash flow never comes? Right. Or what if it takes too long? Okay. So that is. Uh, an even more important concern because we know already, right? Uh, it's the argument I just showed you. We know that COVID-19 generated an increase in corporate leverage. In fact, I, was, I should have gotten these numbers for the talk, but uh, uh, I just saw someone presenting yesterday, uh, corporate leverage apparently increased by 7% uh, during uh, 2020 as a result of what companies did, you know, to basically respond to COVID-19. But you, we are, uh, what I do have for you is uh, data on prices, and it's pretty clear that credit risk has moved to a, to a higher level. Okay, so that's the same chart I showed you before. Uh, uh, bond spreads were really high, right, at the, begin at the beginning of 2020. They have come down, but even now, you know, in, in uh, July, it's pretty clear, especially for high yield bonds, right? Uh, high yield bonds were, for, were trading at a 4% spread, in 2020, and now they are trading at 7%. So uh, uh, the, the advantage of credit spreads is that these are forward-looking. So this, this data is basically telling us that the, the bond market sees trouble ahead, right? At, or at least risk, right? You know, it sees risk. It's risky, okay? And this is the question that I want to talk about next, right? Are we, is this going to lead to a financial crisis? Right, so uh, we are still in the middle of COVID-19. Corporations responded to COVID-19 by issuing more debt, right? So they, they are even more, more levered than, than they were in the beginning of the crisis. So what's going to happen, okay? At this point, uh, you know, we really have to start thinking about public health as well, right? This is a public health crisis and there is no way we can make predictions without thinking about the, 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 the virus. So this is partly what I want to do, but also uh, think about government policy as well. So 
In terms of the virus, I think, uh, you know, to overly simplify, uh, I think we probably have three different scenarios. And the most likely scenario, in my view, is what uh, economies are calling the careful economies. So I want to focus a lot on that. But of course, you know, there is a chance that we're going to be back to normal, right? Uh, sooner than later, if a vaccine comes. This is kind of an effective vaccine scenario. Uh, and then, you know, there is the really bad scenario, which is, you know, it's not clear it's a second wave, right? Uh, you know, but this is being called the second wave scenario in the US, where we're, going, we're basically going to have to have a significant uh, lockdown. So let me talk about this a bit. Uh, if we are back to normal in 2021, I think we're done. At least this is good news. Uh, there is nothing else to talk about. I could end the talk now because the corporate sector, you know, the, 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 the data we have suggests that the, the corporate sector is probably hedged against a bad 2020 already. The corporate sector has enough liquidity to, uh, to survive, you know, even if 2020 is a really bad year, you know, uh, the, 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 um, um, the corporate sector is ready for it. And this, uh, the, 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 the uh, title of this article for Ruth, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good way to summarize this. So for, for Ruth, uh, which cocktail to order is the only liquidity concern. So they're basically done, <laughs> okay? So good. The problem is, you know, what if there is no, no vaccine, right? So, uh, the, you know, uh, the uh, public health people I talk to, are not very optimistic that there's going to be a vaccine so early. And so I think we have to think about what's going to happen to the virus. So uh, let me share with you that the, 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 uh, the uh, place I like to go to get projections about uh, um, in, uh, you know, how, how the virus situation is going to play out is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. I, uh, you know, I'm happy to be married to a, a researcher in public health. So she always helps me uh, uh, with this topic. So uh, this is a very nice website uh, that has, not only it has current and past data, but it also has projections, right? And in finance, we're always interested in projections. So this is the USA, right, uh, average. And this is what the US looks like in terms of estimated daily infections. So these are estimated. This is, this is not uh, confirmed infections. So I think this is the, the data that we, it's probably easier to go back in time and then uh, look into the future. So right now we are here. This is today. Okay. So we have about, in the U.S., we have about 20 daily infections per 100,000. And uh, the good news is we have come down from, you know, the worst period of the crisis, which uh, was uh, late the March, uh, early April. But if you look at this picture, right, uh, the University of Washington is forecasting a significant increase in the number of infections going into the fall. Okay. Why is this? It basically comes from projections of social distancing, right? So we know that uh, the lockdowns increase, so increase social distancing a lot, but basically the University of Washington is assuming that social distancing is going to be relaxed further and further until it goes back towards a normal level. So this is what underlies these projections. And the, the question that I have uh, is whether this is really warranted, right? I mean, the projections are basically based on the gradual relaxation of social distancing. But as we're seeing now, you know, in many states, infections and deaths are picking up, right? And uh, it's not clear that the re relaxation is really going to continue, right? So in fact, uh, there are economists who have thought about this already. In a sense, the amount of social distancing that we see in the economy is endogenous, right? So, uh, because people are afraid of dying, right? You know, they're going to relax to the virus in a, very, uh, in a very clear way. So if infections and deaths start going down, then people relax behavior. If infections and deaths go up, people become more careful. And if people don't do it on their own, the government might force them, them to. And, uh, and this has good and bad news. So the, 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 the good news is that it might help preserve public health. But the bad news is the virus doesn't go away because if the situation gets better, people relax and you know, start partying again. I don't know, right? But, and then the virus doesn't go away. 
okay? And this is what economists are calling the, the, the careful economy. So the, the, the careful economy is the situation in which, you know, we, we don't have a vaccine, right? So the only way we can protect public health is by continuing to do social distancing. But social distancing is not so good for the economy, right? Uh, social distancing is the reason why, uh, you know, we have a negative cash flow shock, you know, people are not consuming. So, and this situation is going to persist, right? Because if we, with no vaccine, the economy is going to continue being careful, okay? Uh, you know, of course, the, the, the good news is if social distancing really is endogenous, right, then maybe we're going to be able to avoid the worst scenario that uh, the situation gets completely out of control and then the government has to come back and lock, you know, lock down everything again, okay? But, but in any case, the, the, the careful economy, which I think is the most likely scenario, it might move into 2021. And what economists are worried about is, you know, if the careful economy does move into 2021 and if, you know, who knows how long this is going to take, right? Then the corporate sector may be in trouble because remember what we discussed, there is a, the, the, you know, the, the, there is a shock to, to profits, but now the shock is persistent, right? Now it's not just a temporary shock. Now you have lower profits going into the future. And you have all this debt that was issued in 2020 and the, the, you know, the debt is going to start coming due, right? Are we going to have a financial crisis, right? So this is really the possibility. And, you know, I don't have, uh, if, you're, if you're expecting an answer for, for this, I don't have a clear answer. I do have some thoughts about what we can do in order to mitigate this. Uh, if you look at bankruptcy data so far, Bankruptcies have not gone up in 2020 to an extraordinary level. Of course, it has increased, but uh, bankruptcies are still lower than, than they were after the, the 2008 financial crisis. Okay, but as I discussed, you know, the, 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 the problem is uh, we are not sure, right? You know, it, it might be that in, going forward, we're going to have a wave of corporate bankruptcy. So what, what can the government do? to cope with the careful economy, right? If, if this really is our future, if the careful economy is our future, what does the government, what can the government do? So I think I have some thoughts here, both on the liquidity side, but also on uh, public health. So um, on the liquidity side, it's pretty clear that the government is gonna have to provide even more liquidity, right? It's not good, whatever was done so far, is not gonna be enough. But then the problem is at some point we're going to hit a limit. You know, even the US government cannot stand forever, right? At some point we're gonna hit the, a budget constraint, okay? And then the other concern that economists are starting to worry about is the possibility that you may, be, uh, you may start having zombie firms. So there may be some firms that really should be liquidated, right? And, but they are gonna be propped up because of these um, liquidity problems. But in, in, in any case, it seems pretty clear that, that the government is gonna have to spend more money and this is a challenge. The other challenge I wanna point out is that uh, there are some firms that might have to be taken care of. So uh, this, this, uh, de this table here comes from a very interesting talk by Jeremy Stein, uh, focusing on an evaluation of the Fed Treasury program. And so, and this is basically telling us uh, which firms qualified for the, for liquidity help in the US uh, in the CCF Main Street and PPP. For example, the CCF reaches 60% of the employment in the US. So, uh, uh, you know, even, even if you focus only on the large and safe firms, you are already uh, uh, reaching a very uh, significant part of the US economy. But, the problem is that some firms were left out, okay? And that's basically because of high leverage. So both for large and for mid-sized firms, uh, if you remember the way that the programs were, were structured, uh, these firms were left out because they are too risky. Remember, the government wants to make sure it's making good loans. And these are, you know, highly levered firms. They are risky firms. The government doesn't want to lend to them, okay? And if you look at this data, it's worrying because these firms that are left out 
comprise 26% of the employment in the US economy and 18% of sales, okay? So, you know, there is this trade-off. The government imposed leverage limits to increase chances that the loans are repaid, but that restriction leaves leverage, you know, highly levered firms out, and these are precisely the firms that are going to go bankrupt, right? So if the problem is a wave of bankruptcy, you know, then the, the government currently has nothing you know, has no program that to help uh, firms that are approaching bankruptcy. And this is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, I'm almost, I, I have a few minutes left here. I'm not gonna have time to go over the, the uh, details, but I do have um, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, several references that you can look at. Uh, economists are thinking very actively about this. This is one of the, the key topics that is being studied right now in the US. What can the government do you know, what's going to be the, 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 the next wave of uh, liquidity provision in the U.S.? So two interesting ideas that I saw. The first one is by an economist called Jeremy Stein. Uh, uh, and his suggestion is that what the government should do is, instead of uh, uh, facilitating debt, what the government should do is to, try, is to start injecting equity in companies. So, uh, you know, it's preferred equity, which uh, as we know in, in corporate finance, this is what venture capitalists do. So Jeremy Stein has this very interesting term that uh, the, the US government might have to become a venture capitalist of last resort in order to help the US uh, corporate sector. And the other idea is from uh, a, a couple of guys called uh, Marcus Brunamai and uh, Krishnamurti. And what they are suggesting is that what the government can do is instead of a, a new CCF, the uh, government can provide financing conditional on bankruptcy. And in, in corporate finance, we have instruments that are designed uh, 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 in order to, to facilitate this. So this is called the debtor in possession financing, which is a way that you can make uh, uh, loans even for companies that are, that are approaching bankruptcy. And the advantage of doing this is that if you focus on bankrupt firms, the government is focusing directly on the problem, right? If the problem is a wave of bankruptcy, let's focus on firms that are approaching bankruptcy. So this is what Bruno Mari and Krishnamurti are suggesting. But in any case, it's pretty clear that the next wave of um, uh, Fed treasury policies is going to have to address this bankruptcy problem more directly, okay? And uh, let me uh, end the talk with some thoughts about public health. You know, we're all becoming uh, pub, uh, public health researchers now because there's no other uh, way, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, here's an idea. So the, the, you know, the, the problem for the economy going forward is the careful economy, right? Uh, and the reason why we have a careful economy is because we want to protect public health. So it's a very valid goal. Here's the question. Can the government make the economy less careful while still protecting public health? And it turns out that the answer may be yes. Let me show you a picture. When I, sh when I saw this picture, I, uh, I, I thought it was staggering, quite frankly. So from the same website, the University of Washington, and uh, these are the, you know, the top line are the existing projections based on behavior, uh, you know, currently in the US. And then you have this green line. The, the, the green line assumes that there is universal usage of masks in the US. And you can see that the, the, you know, there is a huge difference, right? So if, the, if our policymakers can convince people or maybe force people to wear masks, right? You know, there's gonna be a lot less transmission of the virus and, you know, and, one thing that we know is that economists love masks. Why? Because if you think about the face mask, this is a, this is a type of intervention that is very effective at uh, reducing infections and deaths, but it still allows social distancing to decline. So this projection here from the University of Washington, you know, this uh, green line, it has exactly the same assumptions about social distancing that we saw before. So social distancing here is predicted to go to zero by uh, November. But you know, if you have masks, you're, you're not gonna crush the virus to zero, but you're gonna have a much more reasonable situation. And masks are also very good for the economy because you know, some 
you, you, you can basically go back and to many, uh, you know, many regular activities, right? And you can make the economy less careful uh, while, you know, at the same time uh, protecting public health. So this is one idea. The other idea that economists are thinking about as well is an idea of having, uh, if, if we do have to have new lockdowns, uh, maybe we should consider having more targeted lockdowns. So the government has to think more carefully about, uh, you know, which type of lockdowns are really necessary and maybe think more about economic trade-offs because, you know, the situation might get really uh, ugly going forward if the, you know, as we discussed, if, if the careful economy persists into the future and, uh, and, uh, and the virus doesn't go away, right? Uh, social distancing may be here to stay and maybe even lockdowns might be here to stay. So the government has, uh, could perhaps, to, to, you know, try to be a little bit more strategic and target specific people or specific locations. You know, there are many different targeting ideas that are being discussed out there. There is this one paper that uh, is in my reading list that I, uh, that you might want to have a look at. It focuses on, um, you know, uh, uh, targeting uh, people who are more susceptible to, a, to a, a, a serious problem. But anyway, I have here, just to end, let me mention, I have this bibliography that has both academic articles and also some blogs. Uh, there are some videos from other people. There is a lot of research going out, uh, you know, uh, going on about uh, the coronavirus and the economy. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we're going to be able to come up with reasonable solutions. So thank you. Uh, let me stop here. I think uh, you know I used up my my time, and let's open up for questions. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> thank you, Hator, uh, for a great talk. We've got lots of wonderful questions in the Q and A. I have some here that I've tagged to share with you. Um, we'll spend the next ten to twelve minutes working through a few questions, and then wrap this up right about two o'clock. So I'm going to dive right in. Uh, why does it seem that Wall Street is so out of sync with the current economic realities affecting most people because of the pandemic? Uh, will well, the crisis, so there's a couple questions here in one, will the crisis on Ma Main Street ever play out on Wall Street? And if so, how long will that take? And how do you see the divergence between the performance of Wall Street and Main Street playing out in the future? Uh, yeah, um, I think the answer to the first question, so there, there, there are two, two different uh, issues here. So the answer to the first question is, my, it, it, you know, it, when, when you look at uh, analyst forecasts, it's, you know, you know like I, I, uh, if you remember that red line I showed in the beginning, it's pretty clear that uh, right now we, we expect profits to go back up in 2021. This is the, the, the average expectation in financial markets. So that's part of the, 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 the story is that I think analysts are expecting, you know, a very quick recovery. And I'm not sure this is a good forecast. You know, I mean, forecasting is always tricky, right? And uh, as, I, as I discussed today, I think it's very questionable, right? That uh, whether this is really going to happen. So I, I, I think it may be the case that uh, Wall Street is out of sync uh, with uh, with the cash flow forecasts, and of course, stock prices don't depend only on profit forecasts. It also it also depends on risk aversion, and um, you know it seems that investors are pretty bold <laughs> right now about about risk, which is a good thing. You know, this I have not there's nothing wrong with that. But I I share the the concern as I I told my MBA shouldn't be here. This is a time where. I'm, I'm starting to get a bit worried about the stock market as well. I think, but I think the other point that is interesting is, uh, you know, like, as I said in the beginning, this price started in Main Street, but it might end up in Wall Street because of the following. Uh, you know, banks, of course, are making loans, right? They are making, you know, their uh, um, uh, companies are drawing down on credit lines. And uh, banks are on the other side providing this uh, liquidity. And the, the other uh, issue that is being discussed now is now the, the, there is a chance that this crisis is going to start on Main Street and then end up affecting banks if it goes on for, for too long, which is, of course, only going to make it more, pro more problematic. Right? So this is, uh, yeah, this, is, this is how I would answer that. But it's a tricky question. You know, making forecasts is always hard. 
Yes. Excuse me. Abs absolutely. So kind of on the subject of uh, making forecasts, and again, I know uh, you mentioned uh, being married to a researcher in public health, and so you certainly have an interesting perspective here, but um, this idea of making forecasts, how can analysts start to make recovery predictions when there's no definitive timeline for a vaccine? Um, and again, as you said, right, addressing the economic crisis without addressing the public health crisis is a challenge. Um, when does, yeah. what, what, what do you, rec what do you, what do you see here? What, what opportunities are there? How can we think about this? Well, I mean, that's why I think it's important to look at, uh, forecast for the virus. That's really what it's all based on, you know, I, I have to say, I, I look at this website of the, the University of Washington almost every day, <laughs> you know, both for the U.S., for different countries, Brazil, you know, I'm from Brazil, uh, you know, uh, different places in the U.S. I think that really is the basis of everything. And it does seem that, you know, the, the, the forecast for the propagation of the virus are a little bit out of sync with the economic forecast, unless we have an effective vaccine soon. So maybe what, uh, you know, this is what analysts are betting on, right? Is that, uh, that we're gonna have a vaccine and this is going to allow the, you know, the economy to become less careful right and basically takes care of the situation and as i said in the beginning it's it's a small point but it's important right that uh the u.s corporate sector has addressed 2020 so it doesn't matter what happened in 2020 uh i think the uh, the, the corporate sector has enough liquidity you know to to survive this this short-term shock as long as the shock is temporary i think we're fine we're really going to be enter be in a problematic situation if uh, if this lasts into 21 and 22 right uh, yeah you know then i don't know but. yeah so given the outlook for the economy uh again looking grim right can as uh, some states reinstate lockdown and, and we kind of go through this cycle um and the impact that this will likely have on uh future cash flows how do you suggest companies handle existing debt should they borrow more to pay some of the existing debt uh, since the well, rates are low? Boost cash to borrow by borrowing more. This, this is what I this is what I said before. I mean, companies have done what they could already. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't think there is no easy answer here. If the if the if the crisis is temporary, then companies have addressed it. If the crisis becomes permanent then there really isn't anything companies can do. You know, many companies are going, going to go bankrupt and uh, issuing more debt is not going to help because at some point they are not going to be able to. Like, like I said, you know, even the, the, the current government programs are not helping, you know, firms that are approaching bankruptcy. So I think what, what will need to happen is uh, policymakers are really going to invest, uh, they're going to have to invest resources to try to make the bankruptcy process as smooth as, as possible, you know? So thinking about providing financing for bankrupt firms or maybe having this venture capitalist of last resort, you know, this is Jeremy's idea, which I think is very good. Maybe the government has to just inject equity in companies. And then the question is, of course, who gets the equity, right? You know, and then there's political issues and all that, but the idea in itself is very good because the advantage of preferred equity is that uh, preferred equity is not going to lead to bankruptcy, right? So it's an alternative. And uh, I, if the crisis goes on, I think uh, it's going to move in that direction. Either equity or some really uh, more uh, policies that are more, that are targeted more of uh, at bankrupt firms and how to restructure in order to preserve value and employment and all that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay, I think this will probably be our last question, but as you you know look at the current landscape what new policies or products do you see potentially being brought to the market by large and medium scale lenders for corporate liquidity manage and do you foresee that there might be new types of lenders in the market focusing more on liquidity management given the current environment well, it's, a, it's a good question i don't think i've seen anything happening yet because Right now, everybody's living in crisis mode, right? So we're just thinking about survival. 
But going forward, I think it's an interesting thought. Uh, uh, what do we know about credit lines? I mean, I didn't go into all the details, but the research on credit line suggests that it's mostly large and safe firms who can really rely on credit lines for liquidity. So in order to have this insurance contract, you have to have a pretty good standing with, with the bank. So it's, it's, it's always the case with insurance, right? You know, everybody's happy to sell you insurance if you don't need it, <laughs> right? And then you are, when you're very sick, no, you know, the, the, no, no one wants to sell you insurance. So it's the same thing in financial markets, right? And, but this is an interesting thought. Um, there, there, there may be ways to get creative, right? And uh, improve liquidity management mechanisms for, for small companies as well. Then maybe they don't have access to right now, but uh, going forward, um, that, uh, I agree with whoever said that, that there is a scope for financial innovation. And another point, of course, is I think this crisis shows the importance of credit lines, right? And there are some companies that I think when you, when you look at the data, there are companies who could have more liquidity insurance, but then choose not to. Right. It's like, you know, people who don't have life insurance. Right. You know, and um, yeah, I mean, not, not everybody has to have life insurance, by the way, but uh, people who need life insurance and don't have it. Here's the same thing. There are many companies who seem to need insurance, but choose not to have it. And I think that's a lesson from the crisis is that having this liquidity insurance can be crucial. Right. This is this is what Ruth did. All, you know, if, if Ruth didn't have that credit line, they would be in big trouble because uh, Roofs actually does not qualify for any government program because they they don't issue bonds, so they they actually don't qualify for the corporate credit facility. Then they are too highly levered to qualify for Main Street, so they didn't qualify for Main Street either. And they actually try to borrow from the Paycheck Protection Program, so that's a fun effect. So they actually try to use the third program. But then it, it, get, it went into the news, you know, it's so absurd. Roof's Hospitality Group is this public firm using the PPP. But it turns out it was the only program that they could turn to. They were left out of the other, of the other two. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, if they didn't have that credit line, they would be in really bad shape. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we want to eat a steak at Roof's Chris in the future, think about, you know, this is probably due to the credit line, <laughs> right? <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Professor Almeida. This has been really great. We really appreciate all of your insights today. Um, thank you to all of our participants for attending this webinar, bringing great questions to, uh, to our conversation. We invite all of our participants to take a moment, moment to respond to our participant poll in the Zoom window before you sign off. Um, and we hope you've gained some, some valuable knowledge. Um, and we hope you'll, excuse me, we hope you'll join us for our next webinar on Tuesday, September 1st at 2.30 p.m. Central Time with Professor Nehemiah Scott, who will present on the disruptive impact of COVID-19 on supply chains. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all then and wish you a great day ahead. Thanks again, Professor. Thank you.